If you want to play better doubles, then you've clicked on the right video. Today we're going to be comparing and contrasting 3.0 level doubles with 5.0 level doubles and seeing how they cover the court differently. What are they leaving open? What are they shutting down? And why and when? And before we get to that, first of all, thank you so much for all the incredible feedback on our previous video. It was obvious that you're all super hungry for strategy analysis. And that's what we're gonna be doing more of today is looking at real life doubles points and looking at the difference between different levels. But thank you all so much for all of your comments, all of your thumbs up. That really helps the videos, helps the channel very, very much. So go ahead, give the video a thumbs up and we'll dive right in. The first thing that we need to cover is what is most valuable on a doubles court? What part of the court is most important to cover. And if we look at a, a diagram here of doubles, I think a lot of players are super concerned with what is happening. Let's just say that you're this player here and you're being a good little tennis player and you're making sure that you cover your alley, right? How many times have you been told by a partner to cover your alley after you get passed down the alley? And so there's tennis players all around the world that are super concerned with, with what's happening right here when, in particular, when the ball is over on this side of the court, going back to the baseline player on the other side. And if you're this player at the net, and you're thinking a couple of shots ahead in the point, and you know your partner is getting ready to hit a shot, hopefully avoid the other net player, and hit it back to the other baseline player, what are you thinking about? If you're thinking a couple of shots ahead and already concerned about getting beat down your alley, and you're being a good doubles player and making sure this is shut down, then what have we just done? We just opened up a massive hole in the center of the court, and that is the most valuable real estate in doubles, the middle of the court. Why? Because the ball travels back and forth at an angle most of the time, and that bisects the center of the court, which is high percentage, and that is low. There's a lot of space when you go corner to corner, and so, if you cover your alley like these two players are, then you leave a massive gap in the middle for the two defensive players to hit to. And that's a massive, massive problem because it makes life easy for your opponents. These two players, if they're smart, should be covering the middle as much as possible. And that's what we're gonna be really diving into in today's video. Let's go right to the court and look at some real world examples. Big thank you to YouTube user Will A for uploading this video. This is footage from 6.0 Mixed Nationals in 2019. So we have, you know, combination of 6.0. It could be a 2-5 player with a 3-5 player, or it could be two 3-0 players. You get the idea. So what we're going to look at is a couple different point scenarios. And this first one, there's a serve being hit by the player on the other side of the court, and we have a return being hit by the player closest to us. Now what I really want to draw your attention to is the player in blue on our side of the court. As the serve hits, what is the player in blue doing? He's moving forwards and to his left. And so this person is moving away from the center and towards his alley. So he is actively opening space in the center of the court for potentially this other net player to hit into. And so, again, check it out. Let me go ahead and erase this for you. Watch the, the replay here. Before the serve even lands, he's leaving the center of the court. The whole reason for him to start here, which is a pretty good starting position, is so that he can block the center of the court from any attacks coming from that opposite net player. If he just moves away from the center, then what's the point of him even starting there? He might as well just start in the middle of his box and just leave the whole middle of the court open because he's leaving before he even sees what his return player is going to do with the ball. Now, is it, pos is it possible that she just always kills her return? Yeah, absolutely. But this is the first point of the match. He doesn't know yet if this person is really active, if they like to poach a lot, what the situation is with that other net player. So by leaving the center wide open, he makes a very easy target for that opposing net player. So contrast that with some 5.0 level tennis players. Uh, this is me, this is Kevin. 
I played D2 college. Kevin played D1 college. This is Scott and Nate from PlayYourCourt.com. Scott played D1 college, and Nate played combination of D1 and, and D3. So when the ball lands in the service box coming to me, look at where Kevin's position is here. He's back behind the service line, similar width as the 3.0 player that we looked at. But watch the difference when the ball is hit by me. Kevin is responding by squeezing towards the middle. The reason why he's squeezing towards the middle is because he's keeping an eye on Nate over here. And as soon as he sees Nate be like, oh, I really want to get to that ball, Nate makes his split step and then squeezes towards the center to try to pressure me. Kevin responds by also squeezing towards the middle. So this is the exact opposite response is what we saw in the 3.0 level point. The 3.0 level point player was moving away from the middle and forwards. Kevin has actually scooted back a little bit and squeezed towards the middle in case Nate cuts off the ball. If Nate cuts off the ball, the last place that, that Kevin and I want to give up is the middle of the court. If Nate can hit some kind of fancy angle over here, some kind of fancy Oh, sorry. Or some kind of fancy angle over here. We're totally fine with that. We're going to say, Nate, great job, man, and go over to the next point. But what we don't want to do is just abandon this and say, here you go, Nate. Go ahead and hit right to the very center of the court, which is the easiest possible target. Here's point scenario number two. We're in the middle of an exchange here. This player has just hit a return of serve. And this time, who we're going to really study is this person in black right here, up at the net. This is super, super important. After the ball has cleared and gone back to his partner back on the opposite baseline, I want you to watch his feet and how his position changes. In fact, let's just go ahead and make a mark right here. Here's the position of his feet right now. And so let's go ahead and roll the points and watch how the ball travels back behind him and the ball is being hit by his partner right now. So one foot has moved back about a foot or so, maybe six inches. And so what's happened uh, with his opponent? Watch what his opponent has done. His opponent has crept forwards into a, a more offensive position, and as the ball is hit, nothing has happened with this person's position. And so what do you think his opponent's target is going to be if he gets his racket on the ball. Everybody at home answer. Anywhere in here. Massive, ma you could literally drive a truck through the middle of that hole between those two players. And so again, we've opened up huge target in the easiest spot on the court. This is the highest value real estate on the doubles court and nobody is covering it. So, Obviously, big problem here. Now let's compare that to a similar situation on the 5.0 level courts. Here Nate is hitting a serve. I'm hitting the return. I float the return cross court. Scott identifies that he's not going to have a play on it. And now let's make those same, those same marks. So here's Scott's starting position with his feet. And so as the ball moves past him and back to his partner, Watch what Scott does. By the time his partner hits the ball right here, Scott's moved back about a solid third of the service box. That's, that's like six, seven, eight feet that he's scooted back. Had he stayed in the same position right here, then it leaves that big open chunk of real estate in the middle for Kevin to be able to target. But because he scoots back, he's able to plug up a big chunk of that. And Nate, Nate can cover some of this as well if he's paying attention and anticipating. But you can see here that Scott is not being passive and just standing there and watching Nate. He's doing something to improve his position. And specifically, he's making sure that he doesn't leave open the biggest, easiest target on the court for Kevin to potentially hit on the next shot. So Scott, nice job there anticipating getting yourself in the right spot so that Kevin's not left with a super easy shot. Again, could Kevin cut across and hit some kind of crazy angle over here? 
yeah, it's possible. What do you think is easier, hitting this shot or hitting this shot? Obviously, the shot right down the middle of the court is much, much higher percentage, much easier to hit. Scott would much rather that Kevin try that shot over and over than just give him this shot. <laughs> this is exactly, this is exactly the... <laughs> The diagram I drew, like, kind of funny when I was like, cover your alley, cover your alley. And that's exactly what I didn't even, I didn't even realize that when I set it up. <laughs> Another example here, and this is kind of funny, I, I'm just looking at it. I, I did the intro kind of off the cuff, and I didn't realize I was going to make the, the diagram with both players at the net. It's kind of covering, you know, their alley like, like you're supposed to. And I put that in air quotes because you're not supposed to cover your alley. Well, look at what both players are doing here. Covering their alley, covering their alley. And so what's super, super open? The, the middle of the court. And so this is, just the, this is just the starting position. Serve is about to be hit by that opposing player. And this serve happens to go out wide. And so when this person gets stretched off the court and has no choice but to get pulled off the court, what does that do? What, how does the relationship change between this person and this person? The amount of space between them is opened. It's exposed even more. There's even a larger target for this player at the net to poten potentially hit to. And so what do you think the response of this player should be? Well, the further this player gets pulled off the court, the further this person should squeeze towards the middle because otherwise there's a more and more aggressive opening for either of their opponents to hit to. And so watch as the ball lands in the service box, stretches the partner, and what's this person going to do? And, oh, good try. Now had the ball come back, there's obviously a huge liability here. What does is, what is, what is this person have locked down right now? this section of the court right here. What is left? The whole court. The whole rest of the court is open because this person has been pulled off the court. So let's go over to the 5-0 court and see what the difference is. So back to the 5.0 level match, we're gonna see a really similar setup here where Nate serves out wide, Kevin gets pulled, and by the way, look at my starting position here. The 3-0 player that we looked at, his starting position was quite close to the alley. I mean, he was probably around here. I mean, if we want to be really generous, uh, maybe, maybe like around here. I'm beginning in a really aggressive squeezed position because I want to take away as much as possible from Scott. I'm totally fine with Scott trying this shot. The last thing I want to do is give him any real estate here to work with. So I'm beginning in a pretty aggressive position already. But as I see my partner get pulled off the court by a good serve from Scott, and I recognize that. Watch my response. My attention turns to Scott, and my position shifts with Kevin so that I'm sure I've got the, the, the contrast here is I'm, I've parked myself literally in the center of the court because I'm watching Scott like a hawk. If Kevin gets this serve back and Scott intercepts it, the last place I want to be is just hanging out over here by my alley because I just leave Scott the easiest shot in the world to just basically just punch it straight forwards. So this shifting to cover the middle is key. And in all three of the scenarios that we just went through, you can see that there's a pattern of leaving the middle exposed or middle awareness and closing the middle, squeezing the middle. This one thing is a huge difference between beginner to intermediate level doubles and higher level doubles. And by the way, I just wanna say that the, the players that we took a look at, 3-0 players, you guys are incredible. Thank you so much for making your footage available for all of us to check out. And I hope that, that this quick breakdown is helpful to you. It lets you know exactly what you can do to improve your doubles. And if you're watching at home right now and you've enjoyed this video and it gives you something really specific to work on, do me a favor and click like. It really helps the video a lot. It helps more players be able to see the content. It helps more tennis players 
find out exactly what they can do to improve their game. Let me know down below, what would you like to see next? Uh, what kind of breakdown would you like to see next? Whether it's singles, doubles, technique, whatever. Leave a comment and also leave a link to your match footage if you'd like me to break down yours and let you know exactly what to do so that you can go to the next level.